Hi, I'm Keith Alexander, the CFO of Expression Biotech. You can probably already tell I'm American. I'm a, living in Denmark as a permanent resident, uh, although I am an American citizen. Today I'm going to talk about Expression Biotech. Uh, here's our very important disclaimer, which I'm sure you've all read already. Uh, it's the basis for the, comp for the uh, presentation that I'll give today. What is Expression Biotech? Uh, some of you may already know us. We're a vaccine producer based in Hörsholm, Denmark, which is about 20 minutes north of Copenhagen. Uh, we have a pipeline of key assets in infectious diseases and oncolo oncology. Though we've been around for much longer, we've been around since 2010 uh, and have our roots as a contract research organization uh, making different proteins. In fact, our name expression with the S2 it's a reference to S2 cells from the uh, Drosophila melanogaster fruit fly, uh, which are also known as Schneider S2 cells. Um, so we've been around for a little while, uh, but we transitioned to a pipeline-driven company at the end of 2019, early 2020. It's been a great time to do that. The growth in that marketplace has been quite high. Even taking COVID out of the equation, there has been a very large increase in uh, in uh, investment and, and interest in vaccines. And I, I know before COVID, it was not the most sexy market, but it's become much more interesting. Uh, as you'll hear in the presentation that I give now, we have a lot of interesting catalysts that are coming up, uh, some in the next few months and, and many more much further out. We have a very professional management team. Uh, our CEO, Ben Franson, probably m many of you have already seen before. He's giving two presentations today that he committed to already, so that's why he's not the one giving the presentation. I hope that I can do a decent job. Uh, our VP of R&D Technology, Max, he's very involved in our CMC work related to our pipeline. Meta Torn, uh, she's involved in preclinical development. And Matisse Ranta, he's in charge of the clinical development, and he's working on a clinical development plan for our wholly owned breast cancer uh, vaccine. On top of that, we have a, a very good board of directors. Dr. Martin Jensen, he's a co-founder, been with the company for 10 years. Jakob Knudsen, he's uh, the CEO of Virogates. Dr. Karen Gar is a GM at Symphogen. And Sarah Sand is a, uh, a member of the VEX Fund investment team. My background is in investment management. I have a degree from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. I worked for JP Morgan in New York City for about 10 years, first as an investment analyst following as a uh, strategist. And then I moved to Danske Bank in, in Copenhagen, where I worked for about 10 years, advising pensions around the world, some here in Stockholm, also Helsinki, but also Beijing, uh, all around Japan and North America. So what, what is the platform? We basically are combining two key platform aspects. First, there's the Express2 uh, platform, which essentially make cells produce very specific proteins. And then we combine that with the CVLP technology from ADAPTVAC. It's a virus-like particle. And what it does is it attaches our Express2 proteins to a capsid, uh, uh, capsid surface. And together what it is, is it creates a molecule that looks like a virus to your body. It doesn't have any of the harmful uh, DNA inside the, the virus, but it triggers the immune response. <laughs> So together, it's a, it's a pretty powerful vaccine platform. We own 34% of ADAPTVAC. It was actually a joint venture that we started with the University of Copenhagen back in 2016. We have a lot of various publications that support uh, the proof of concept and, and the platform uh, more broadly. Just last week, we had a, a new piece of, uh, of research that went out on our, on our uh, breast cancer vaccine. And it's just the latest in a long list of research publications that validate the platform. Now, about our programs. Presented before you see our pipeline. Uh, the two top assets are our lead assets. The first one is a corona uh, virus vaccine that we developed in consortia with ADAPFAC. That is completely out licensed to Bavarian Nordic now, so they're running with it. It's in phase three uh, trial right now. We've, uh, we're expecting early data in around the end of the year, maybe December, maybe January, around that time frame. Uh, right now, it looks very, very good. What we've seen so far is that it elicits an immune response that is, is three or four times higher than the mRNA peers. 
Uh, it is very durable. It can be transported and stored at room temperature. And most recently, uh, actually just last week, durability data came out from the phase two study. It's shown that it uh, is maintaining a very high level of antibody response even six months after injection, uh, and that, that compares favorably with the mRNA peers. So it still looks very interesting. As long as there is a COVID market for vaccines, uh, we, we think that we have a very good candidate here. And so the next steps for that one, I'll get to in a, in a moment, but we hope it's on the market sometime next year. The next asset that I'll talk about today is our breast cancer vaccine. Uh, this is something that we develop and, and own 100%. It's currently in preclinical development. Uh, we've manufactured the vaccine for clinical testing, and right now it's undergoing safety and toxicity studies. We hope to have some safety data that's coming out at near around the end of the year as well. So there are some inter important milestones coming up. The rest of the pipeline we develop in consortia with various universities, institutes, uh, and, and different uh, groups that the EU has brought together. I'm not gonna talk about them so much today be for two reasons. One, it's not where we spend a lot of our time, and then secondly, it doesn't have a huge material impact on the company in terms of the, the financials and the economics. So I, I frankly think it's maybe not relevant for this audience. It is a good use of our time though, because we learn a lot by working with these, with these partners, and they create options for us in the future. Starting with the breast cancer vaccine, and I start with this one because this is where we spend all of our time now. As I mentioned, the COVID vaccine is in the hands of Bavaria Nordic. Uh, we all know breast cancer is a, a terrible thing. Uh, many of us have been affected by it personally or, or have friends who have. My best, fr best friend's uh, wife actually died from it uh, two years ago. One in eight women will be affected by it. Over 25% or around 25% have ex overexpression of HER2 her receptors, which create more aggressive tumors and reduce survival. And there are about 685,000 deaths every year to uh, breast cancer. On the left-hand side, we talk a little bit about the market right now. There are two key therapies out there, Herceptin, which is owned by Roche, and Progetta. Uh, in total, the marketplace is around 11 billion. These are both monoclonal antibody approaches. There are a few drawbacks, which we mentioned on the right-hand side. Resistance uh, can happen over time, in fact, quite quickly in some cases. There's a potential for cardiac toxicity, and this is not necessarily heart failure, but it's uh, heart weakness, and that can develop into heart failure over time. And then finally, repeated administration is required on a very continuous basis. It's very expensive. It's, it's not an optimal solution. So there's a lot of room for development of better therapies. Uh, our approach is different because we're using the internal antibody response to fight the, the cancer cells. On the next two slides, I'll present some very good data. Uh, it's from our preclinical uh, tests that we've been doing. On the left-hand side, what we're showing is uh, mice who had tumor cells implanted into them and then they were vaccinated every two weeks. And what you can see in the, uh, the red line at the bottom, which is the very, very flat one, uh, when they had uh, the vaccine with adjuvant, there was a complete block of the tumors. And then without adjuvant, it, it partly blocked, the tumors grew less. And then of course, with the control, uh, there was significant tumor development. So you can see that there's a, a real impact there. On the right-hand side, we, we show mice, uh, vaccinated mice that would develop tumors naturally. Uh, these are called Delta-16 mice. And what you can see is the untreated ones, uh, those are the, the black line, they all developed tumors and, and died. And then the treated ones, uh, there was 95% efficacy, uh, so they, they did not die within that time period. We have two more very good data points here, or, or, or sets of data here. On the left-hand uh, side, we implanted HER2 positive tumors into mice, and uh, some that were resistant to trastuzumab and some that were not. And what we, say, we saw was that growth was inhibited for both the ones that were trastuzumab resistant and the ones that were not. So that shows, uh, at least in a preclinical setting in a mice model, that uh, it, it works better than trastuzumab, the leading uh, therapy out there. Uh, and, and of course, we wanna test that further in humans in the clinical setting. Uh, that's the really important part. 
On the right-hand side, we show, we, we tested mice that will develop tumors, these Delta-16 mice. They were injected with HER2-positive tumor cells and then vaccinated. And what we show is that the control developed the tumors as expected, and the other ones were tumor-free, both with and without adjuvant. So it looks good on a proof of concept level at the preclinical setting. In terms of the actual project behind this, it's developing as planned. Currently, uh, we have a great team running the project, and the GMP manufacturing is, is moving as planned. Uh, the processes are in development. And then on the preclinical safety side, uh, a CRO has been selected and, and a master service agreement executed. We'll test in two types of animals. Uh, and as early as by the end of this year, we should have some data that we can report uh, on, on the mice. And then we'll do a non-human primate test, uh, which should finish around the middle of next year. So that's the HER2 vaccine. Now I'll, I'll switch over into the COVID vaccine. Is it still relevant? Yes, uh, there, six, there have been 6.5 million deaths so far. The duration of the current vaccines is unknown. Uh, we, we're continually getting boosters. Uh, there are vaccines out there that, that, not for COVID, but that last for much, much longer. Let's take AP, HPV as an example, which is based on very similar technology to ours. You, it's one and done. Uh, the storage and handling requirements I mentioned earlier uh, are, are not ideal, and, and ours can be transferred and, and stored at room temperature. And then there's a the potential for further mutations. Uh, we, we see BQ.1 has come out recently. It's currently 50% of the cases in, in France and, and Spain uh, the, and about 10% elsewhere. The ECDC expects that it'll be about 50% uh, of cases worldwide by the end of November and around 80% by the beginning of the next year. So there are still new mutations. Uh, they can be spread very, very rapidly. We don't have a, a block in place to prevent that from happening. Um, fortunately, BQ.1, there's no evidence that it's any worse than the current Omicron. So that, that's good news. Uh, I'm going to present a little bit of data here on the COVID vaccine. Uh, what we've shown on the left-hand side is that it has a very strong boosting effect across all the variants of concern. The level of neutralizing antibodies is associated with a high level of protection, similar to the mRNA uh, peers. It's the lowest for, for beta and Omicron. And then what we, what we published last week is that the durability appears to be better than for the MR mRNA peers. Now, I just want to say six months of data is, is not a lot for durability. Uh, we're very much looking forward to whether we can report 12-month data. But I have to say that the sample size is decreasing as people get further uh, vaccinations. So we don't know if we can do the 12-month data. We certainly should be able to do it when it comes to the phase three trial. Uh, but we're still looking for further du durability data. Right now, it looks good. On the phase three study, we started that early in September, uh, or Bavarian Nordic started it, and expect to have headline results around the end of the year, maybe early next year. And then after that, Bavarian is planning to do a rolling submission with the FDA and, and uh, other agencies for potential launch in, in uh, next year. The economics of that, how does it affect us? I mentioned before that we have this joint venture or, or associated company, Adaptvac, which we own 34% of. So the license is between Adaptvac and Bavarian Nordic. We have a further licensing agreement with Adaptvac. So first, Adaptvac received 4 million euros up front. That was paid last year or two years ago. They can get up to 136 million euros in, in development and sales milestones. And then beyond that, single to double digit percentage of Bavarian uh, revenues. So what do we get from that? Well, we have our 34% ownership of, of Adaptvac. Uh, in, in my internal model, that's the, the biggest value that we have. We get a, a small commercial milestone payment, euro 2 million. And then on top of that, a lower double-digit percentage of Adaptvac royalties. So that's, that's the way it flows through to us. And then I, I want to just mention a couple of numbers uh, based on the analysts that cover us. There, there are a couple of estimates of the value of this project to expression. Uh, it ranges from 458 million Swedish to 702 million Swedish, or 1188 in terms of a per share value to 1890 in a per share, per share value. Currently, we're trading around 12 and a half. Uh, so that's just this on its own. It's, it's worth more than what our current share price is. So our 
our total uh, value, according to these analysts, is somewhere between 25 and 30 sec per share. I just have a few comments on financials. Uh, as of the end of the second quarter, we had 168 million Swedish kroner, the highest cash position that we've had. So uh, just to answer your cash question already, we, we are pretty well capitalized. Uh, we do have some expensive costs coming ahead of us with the phase one trial. Uh, so that's something to consider. And we are also incurring large costs associated with uh, CMC production and the preclinical studies. Uh, doing a non-human primate trial is, or, or test is not cheap. In terms of our shareholder composition, we have around 14,000 shareholders, mostly in Sweden and Denmark. Thank you very much. And uh, it's pretty stable. I, I'd say that we have a pretty liquid share. Uh, that's also very interesting, I think. Uh, and then talking about uh, market valuations, it's not a great chart uh, since the end, end of last year. Uh, you, you all know that the biotech sector as a whole has been hit, but also the COVID, uh, COVID vaccine producing companies have been hit specifically as the projections have, have come down and, and kind of become a bit more realistic. We've always said that we were producing a vaccine for the endemic, not the pandemic. What does that look like? It could look more like a flu vaccine. Uh, there has been recent very good news. Uh, just over last weekend, Pfizer announced that they were going to quadruple their vaccine prices, uh, and that had a positive impact on our share. Uh, on top of that, the durability data has been very good for us. And so actually, since this, this chart, which uh, shows through, I believe, the end of last week, our share is actually up 40 percent based on that information. And I think uh, you know we have some very interesting milestone targets ahead of us in, in the coming months uh, that could be also good catalysts. So speaking of what we have coming ahead of us, these are our, our milestones that we're looking at. For COVID, uh, we expect the phase three trial results toward the end of this year, maybe early into next year. And then following that, Bavarian Nordic will initiate their submissions, as I mentioned, and then there's market launch subject to regulatory approval. And so th those are all very big. On breast cancer, uh, we are conducting the GMP manufacturing. Then we have the preclinical safety studies readout. That could be uh, a nice catalyst. And then the filing of the CTA. And we aim to initiate human clinical studies in early 2024. And then after that, you know, once we have some data, data an out licensing window could open up for that, uh, for that uh, indication. And then I'm not going to go into influenza and malaria, but we also have some potential smaller catalysts there in the near future. So that actually ends my remarks. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.